I'm going to follow his lead. This, this is just water, okay? <laughs> well, we're, we're almost through August. How's everyone doing? Taking it day by day, right? I know I am. So it is hot, but it's okay. As, as Zeb said in his prayer, we have AC. Wonderful blessing. And uh, often take that for granted, don't we? Until, like, I remember last year, our AC quit. And uh, that was not fun, so... But uh, go ahead for tonight, open your Bibles, we're in Judges chapter 13, and we're going to look at the birth of Samson. So this is the next uh, major judge, and, and really other than Gideon, he's, he's uh, the one that's talked about the most. And so we'll begin to look at, at Samson here, but go ahead, get into Judges 13. I'm going to actually read through this whole chapter uh, before we begin. So, there we go, have it on the screen as well. So, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren. And have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us. And teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman, and she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah rose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is, to, what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please, let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him 
And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahana Dan between Zorah and Ashdale. So this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Well, Father, we come before you tonight, and uh, as always, we're thankful for your word. Um, your word is always full of truth, and it is designed to guide us, to teach us, and to equip us. And uh, Lord, I would just pray that um, as I have been preparing and praying, uh, Lord, may you uh, speak to your people as you have spoken to me. Um, help us to see your character in this chapter. Um, and help us to learn and grow. And uh, above all things, Lord, I, I pray you would stir us. Uh, help us to love you more, to, to see more of Christ, and Lord, to love the things we see. So I pray and ask these things in his name. Amen. So I want to begin by asking, what would you consider is the best way to try to motivate a person? You know, if you want to move someone in a certain direction, how would you go about motivating them? And uh, really, there's only two that I came up with, and the one would be by rewards. You can give someone a reward and motivate them by the reward, or through punishment. And that's really the only two options, especially in our culture. It's a system of rewards and punishment. And to give you an example, like, you know, obviously in our family, we, we're, we're surrounded with children. And, uh, and so rewards are very effective. Like, for example, when you're trying to potty train, uh, I don't know how you guys did it, but the way we went about it is you get a potty sticker chart and you get the stickers out. And every time they use the potty, guess what? They get a sticker and then they get enough stickers and then they get a reward like an ice cream or, or a special dessert or something they're really excited about. And so you can motivate even a child to do certain behaviors with rewards. But then there's punishments. And you guys know all about that. Um, even if you don't have children, you all were children at one point, And uh, you remember how effective uh, punishment can be. You know, basically, if you don't do what I tell you, this is what's going to happen to you. And that could be a very effective motivator. But then we ask a greater question. How does God often motivate his people? And yes, certainly you can think of many examples throughout scripture of how God uses rewards and certainly punishment to move people in a certain direction. But over and over again, what we see throughout the pages of the Bible is that God uses his grace to motivate his people. And uh, I think that's really strongly highlighted in Judges 13. And uh, I broke this up into just really two things, two examples of God's grace. The first is uh, God graciously provides a savior. He provides a judge, a deliverer. And we see that in verses one through seven. And then the second thing is God graciously provides a sacrifice. And we see that in the rest of the chapter down to verse 25. But Judges 13 begins with the same story we have been seeing all throughout the book of Judges. So in verse one, it says, and the Lord of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So what was, what was the evil that Israel has been doing? Well, really, it's two things. They've been serving and worshiping false gods, and they have been abandoning the Lord. And it says here specifically that this evil was done in the sight of the Lord. And so this may have not been considered evil according to Israel's sight at the time. It certainly wasn't considered evil according to the Philistines' eyesight. But before God, this was a very great evil. And throughout Judges, there's a repeated pattern. And we went over this before in chapter 1 and in especially chapter 2. We see this, this pattern of sin, judgment, repentance, and deliverance. So very simply... Israel sins, God moves in judgment by raising up a, a, a pagan people to oppress them, which in this case it's the Philistines. Then Israel cries out in repentance, asking God, please deliver us. And then God responds by raising up a deliverer, a savior, a judge. And uh, we see this over and over again. Uh, Israel would cry for help and God would send them a savior. But I want you to see uh, the surprise here. So in verse 2, it says, 
there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and you have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink. Eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So I want to ask you, what is missing here? Israel has sinned. God has judged them. And then we see that uh, they're being promised that a deliverer is going to be sent. But what's actually missing here is notice there's no cry of repentance. There's no mention of it. And in fact, I don't think that's an accident. I think that's intentional. I think the author wants you to know that at this point in their history, Israel's come to the place where they're no longer crying out to God. They're just accepting the situation they're in. It's almost like they have dug themselves a hole so deep that there's no hope of getting out of it. And so they're being oppressed by the Philistines. They're they're suffering under their tyranny. And yet no one's lifting their head to cry out to God. No one's asking him to, to help them, to save them, to do anything. And they just accept it. And so this is a really uh, a tragic moment for God's people. Uh, here's what I think we need to see is that this shows us a, a wonderful demonstration of the grace of God. Because God, notice he, he, doesn't, he doesn't wait for an invitation to save them. In this instance, God promises them a deliverer and they didn't even ask for And so he doesn't wait for an invitation from his people for help. It shows how he's full of so much love and grace that God would even take the initiative to do something for his own people that they didn't ask for. And and so that's what we're seeing. He does not wait for their cries for help, but what does he do? He chooses the Savior before the Savior is even born. And and, and again, uh, this this was before... Uh, Not only when Samson was born, this is before he was even conceived. And not only did God promise him, but he he promised what he was going to do, what he was going to be. And so that's that's what we see so far in this passage. Um, God's going to perform a miracle in order to make Samson's birth even possible. Um, We're told in verse 2 that Manoah's wife is childless, she's barren. So that's another aspect of a miracle and the grace of God, that she can't have children, but God's going to do something very special for her. And he's going to work his grace into her life as well. So again, even before the Savior's born, even before Samson enters the scene, God already commands him as to what he's going to do. He says he's to be born a Nazarite. Nazarite means someone that's set apart, someone who's dedicated to the Lord. Um, we find this in Numbers chapter 6, which we won't go there tonight, but in Numbers ch- chapter 6, it makes clear all the conditions to be a Nazarite, to be set apart to the Lord. Um, and one of the unique things about it is you got to choose the length of time. You could do it, let's say, for a few months or a year. But the difference we see in Samson is, is he doesn't get a choice. This is what he's going to be. He's going to be born a Nazarite. And he's going to die as a Nazarite. And, um, of course, you know, you guys that know your Bibles, you, you get into chapters 14 and 15, you quickly find out that uh, Samson breaks every one of these conditions to be a Nazarite. But, but nonetheless, this is what God chooses for Samson. And we see that God's grace is at work here. So he doesn't wait for a cry for help. He chooses the Savior before he is conceived, and he commands the Savior what he is going to do. So the question is, why does God do all this? Well, the first reason is God wants to demonstrate his power and control over seemingly hopeless situations. And we find in the Bible that God often likes to do that. That seems to be a pattern God likes to do. When something seems impossible, he likes to say, oh yeah, watch this. 
and then he does the miraculous. But another thing is God's doing this because, again, it reminds us about how God graciously intervenes to save a people who not only don't deserve it, but they don't ask for it. And that's the same as you and I. None of us, when we were saved, were desperately trying to find God. God opened our eyes. He revealed himself to us. Before we were even asking for him, he was already showing us our need of Christ. And that's the grace of God. So this passage tonight speaks to the immeasurable grace that God has. Um, and this is not the first time or the last time that we see that God uses an impossible birth to, to forward his plan of salvation. Uh, to remind you, uh, Sarah and Abraham back in the book of Genesis. This, this was another example where they couldn't have children. And yet God promised that you will have a son. And then we know the whole story where they tried to take matters into their own hands. And, and they had Ishmael, but that was not the promised son. But lo and behold, it uh, wasn't long where God made good on his promise. And there was a miracle. And they had Isaac. And God's uh, plan of salvation carried through through Isaac. Then there's, uh, if you remember, Hannah in 1 Samuel. She was barren, couldn't have children. And we find that she prays, she calls out to the Lord, and God answers her prayer. And we, and we find that she has Samuel. And God carries his plan of salvation through a, another seemingly impossible situation. And then uh, when we go forward, we see, uh, if you remember, Elizabeth and Zechariah. Here's another example. And, and God once again steps in, um, person that can't have children, and we see that he gives her John the Baptist, who, as we know, becomes the forerunner to Jesus Christ. And so, again, we see this pattern where God seems to like to step in, specifically when there's a woman that can't have a child, and he shows grace and carries forward his plan of salvation through them. All these childless women God used to forward that plan. Now, again, why does God do that again and again? Well, because God is showing his power amidst desperate situations. Um, he sets the pattern, really, for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things you have to recognize is everything that happens in the Bible is not a coincidence. All these people that couldn't have children where God steps in and opens the womb and blesses them in that way, it's building the anticipation and expectation of the ultimate child that would be born, who is Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember Joseph and Mary, they were betrothed, but she was a virgin. So here's an impossible situation. And yet God steps in, and we have the virgin birth. Now, why does God do this? Because he's establishing the pattern that every time there's a woman who is barren and can't have children, God intervenes to provide a savior. And these miraculous conceptions are pointing to and build an anticipation for a miraculous birth of Christ. And, and here's the thing. Did we deserve the arrival of Jesus Christ? Good answer. If I heard a yes, I, I'd be concerned, right? No, we did not. Did we ask for the arrival of Jesus Christ? No. Did you ask for God to send the Savior for your sin? No. But see, God, being full of grace, sent us a Savior through his Son when we didn't deserve him and we didn't even ask for him. That is what's being set up. Now, Manoah's wife, she hears that she will have a son, and this son will be dedicated to God. And we see in verses 6 and 7, uh, she goes to her husband to tell him what this man of God has said. And so it says in verse 6, Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of 
his death. So it seems like she was so excited by the news that she just forgets to ask, well, what is your name? Where are you from? Who, who are you? Um, she says, you know, you're just, she designates him as just a man of God at this point. And um, so she shares this with her husband, and, and here is how Manoah responds. It says in verse 8 that Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And so here it, it appears uh, that Manoah just wants some instructions. Seems like he kind of wants, you know, maybe like a parenting class. Like, okay, if we're going to have this special child and, it's, and, and, and this is going to be unique and he's to be a Nazarite, well then please, uh, I would like a little more instruction on how to be faithful and to carry this out because that's, that's a pretty high calling. And it appears that's what he's asking, but I, I think as we read through this narrative, um, we see that uh, Manoah isn't really interested in being a good father. Um, he's more interested in trying to maintain uh, control in this situation. And what God needs to do now is he needs to change Manoah's heart. Um, he needs to humble him. And so when you look in uh, verse 9, it says, And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah rose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Now, why did the messenger appear when Manoah isn't there? Because this is deliberate. He's, 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 he's not doing this in front of him. And this, this happened twice now. This messenger comes. He speaks to Manoah's wife while Manoah isn't there. And I think, again, it doesn't specifically say, but I think God's doing this to humble him. To humble him. Um, because I think he needs to learn to trust his wife here. He wants more information. In other words, he, he wants this angel to speak directly to him. But he's not doing that. He's speaking to his wife. And then his wife is coming and telling him what the angel told him. In other instances of the Bible, uh, there's no problem. But here, he seems to have a problem with this. Um, I think he feels as though he's being left out. Now, in verse 12, it says, And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, speaking to the man of God, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? And what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. In other words, he's saying, I've already told your wife, so listen to her. That's what he's saying. You need to listen to her. And he continues in verse 14. He says, she may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So that the angel doesn't say anything new at this point. He just reiterates what he's already told his wife. And Again, what, what's the point here? Why is he doing this? Well, because Manoah needs to humble himself over the fact that he wasn't the one the angel came to, and he wasn't the one who was instructed as to what to do. And, uh, and at this point, you know, it seems that Manoah wants to respond by offering something very kind to the angel. So he says in verse 15, Manoah said to the angel, oh Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. So suddenly he seems very hospitable because he's not getting the answers he wants. But now all of a sudden he's very hospitable. Hey, come inside. We'll take a goat. We'll throw it in the oven. Enjoy a meal together. Stay a while. Well, why? Why is he doing this? Well, maybe because he, he's trying to maintain control. He wants to be front and center. Don't go to my wife. Come to me with this. Tell me what's going on. Instruct me. But to Manoah's surprise here, the, the messenger declines his offer. So in verse 16, the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. So here Manoah tries to control the situation. 
Um, you know, in the ancient world, when you were hospitable, it, it was a way of, uh, you know, if someone showed you hospitality, you would reciprocate that. And so it almost seems like he's like, well, come in, enjoy a meal, and then now you kind of owe me a favor. Answer my questions. Talk to me. Come to me. Um, you know, he's wanting control. But the angel of the Lord sees through all this. He refuses Manoah's offer. And again, there's other instances where messengers, angels of the Lord, do come in. They do eat in the Bible. But this time, he says, no, not going to do it. Uh, he sees through it. And he directs Manoah now to offer a sacrifice. He clearly tells Manoah what he would like him to do. And does Manoah immediately do it? No. He tries something else. In verse 17, Manoah said to the angel, Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? See, the problem again is Manoah is still trying to maintain control. And he's trying to call the shots. He, he has been told, go and get the burnt offering. Uh, he's been told, go and offer it to the Lord. But instead, he diverts the conversation to then ask, well, what's your name? And uh, the angel of the Lord replies, well, why do you want to know my name? And then the angel says that his name is wonderful. You see, a person's name, uh, unlike today, it wasn't just a label. Uh, a name uh, defined the person's character. So, for example, all throughout the Bible, God reveals his name. Uh, God has many names, but all those names are important because it's revealing something about who God is. And so this angel of the Lord says that my name is wonderful. And this is the same Hebrew word that's translated wonderful that gets used in Isaiah uh, 9, 6, where it speaks of Jesus Christ as being the wonderful counselor. And um, what the angel's quite literally saying is my name is too wonderful for you to handle. Why do you ask my name? You can't handle my name. It's too beyond you. It's too wonderful. Um, and thankfully, at this point, Manoah begins to understand that he is not in control, that the angel of the Lord is the one who's in control. Um, and the good news is in the end, I think Manoah does finally get it. So in verse 19, uh, it says, so Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. And so here they finally recognize the one they were speaking to. This was the pre-incarnate Christ that they were speaking to. This was not just an angel of the Lord. This was the Lord. This was God himself. And we see how they responded, that they understood who they were speaking to. Uh, they immediately respond, really, as all people in the Bible respond, when they encounter the awesome presence of God. Um, you think of um, people like Isaiah. He sees a vision of the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He sees seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the first thing Isaiah, Isaiah does is he responds, woe is me, pronounces a curse over himself. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips. You think of the disciple John. When he encountered God, he said, I fell down like a dead man. Every time someone encounters God, they are struck by the awesomeness, and it fills them with fear and a trembling, for they have just encountered him. And here they have seen him, and Manoah responds by saying that surely we are going to die. And um, notice how his wife responds. And what's funny is, you know, the wife remains nameless, but all throughout this, her character she has faith. 
She, she seems to understand more about what's going on than Manoah does. This is how she responds. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. So Manoah and his wife just experienced the meaning of the name wonderful. They understood that that's why he couldn't tell us his name. If we knew the one who we were asking, what is your name? We would have never asked. So we see that they obey God. They offer their sacrifice, and God graciously accepts it. So once again, we see the same thing here, the grace of God. God's going to graciously provide his people a savior through Samson. He will be the one to deliver his people from their oppression, and he's going to do this even though Israel wasn't asking for it. Chapter 13 ends with God accepting their sacrifice, and Manoah and his wife, they now wait with anticipation uh, for the birth of Samson. And so, what does this all point us to? And really, I've been struggling all week with chapter 13. I, I was kind of envious of uh, Pastor Zeb getting chapter 12, because even though chapter 12 didn't have a lot of it for me, I found a lot in there. But here, chapter 13, I'm like, well, what am I supposed to tell God's people? Like, what's the whole point of this chapter? Like, yeah, it's his birth, and it's important in the history of Israel, but why does this matter to us? Like, what, what's the big deal here? And, and Lord, help me not to miss it. And I think what it is is that we see again that just like in this period of Judges, uh, God doesn't wait for an invitation from his people. Just like Israel wasn't crying out to God, asking them to deliver him. And just as God graciously responds by providing a deliverer anyways, we see this very same thing happening in Jesus Christ. All of us, because of our sin, loved our sin. We love to indulge in, Paul says, the passions of our flesh, to follow the course of this world, to follow the principality of the air. And we were all walking and enjoying our sin, going from one sin to another. None of us were looking for God or seeking for God or asking for his help. And what does God do? He sends his own dear son. He sends him into this fallen world to live in our place to live the very righteousness we desperately need. To go to a cross where for the joy set before him, he died for the sake of sinners. He took upon himself the own wrath of his father that is supposed to fall upon us. And he died the very death we all deserve to die. And then he rose again on the third day, demonstrating that his life and death was acceptable to God the Father, and he now can grant eternal life to any who come to him. And so really, I think that's the big point of this chapter, and really this whole book, is all, all these judges are temporary deliverers. They're temporary saviors. They're here for a little while to temporarily deliver Israel from their problems, from their oppression, but they all fall short. They're all flawed to the very core. None of these judges amounts to even Samson. When you read chapter 13, if you didn't know what the other chapter said, you'd think, wow, finally, here is a judge that is going to be mighty in the hands of God. And certainly he was. But he's going to deliver his people, and he's going to be an example of what it is to follow and love God. But unfortunately, we see that, that Samson is driven by foreign women, and he sins in many different ways. He, he breaks the Nazarite vow in every possible way. And he's not someone that ultimately can deliver us. And so as the Bible progresses throughout the Old Testament, what we see is that it builds this expectation, uh, really an anticipation for a true and perfect Savior who is none other than Jesus Christ. And so... We see in Christ that he is the true Nazarite to God. At every point, he perfectly obeyed his father. He, he obeyed every command. He resisted every temptation. And he was truly set apart and dedicated over to God. And, and then we see that while we're sinners, and we're not even looking to be saved, just like Israel... Jesus would offer himself as the once-for-all sacrifice for the sake of his people. And that's exactly what he does, and that's exactly what every one of us needs. 
And God is good and gracious because he provided us a perfect deliverer, a perfect savior, one who will never fail, one who will never let you down. And that's what God has done for us. So I hope in Judges 13, you know, we see the birth of Samson. We could see in part what this is all pointing us towards. Um, and one last quick thing. You know, in chapter 12, we see that uh, we end with Jephthah. And then we, we have three other judges. They're quickly named. We have very little details about them. And all of a sudden, here's Samson. And he's not even born yet, and he gets a whole chapter. Why does God do that? Why does God include a lot of details about a guy like Samson, but hardly any details about the previous three judges? Well, I think it's for this reason, because the Bible is not about primarily the stories of man. It's about the actions of God. It's about what he is doing. And that is what scripture is geared towards. It's not focused so much on Samson, although he was used by God, and God did call him and set him apart. And he is important to the salvation story as it's carried forward. And he does, in many ways, point us to Christ. But ultimately, the Bible is about showing us who God is. He is center stage, always. And when we read these accounts of these different men and women who have failed God at many points, they're all patterns. They're all building expectation, anticipation for someone who will not fail us. And you know, as uh, CA mentioned this morning, uh, we're all thinking about politics, about casting votes, our country, the world, and certainly that's a good, healthy thing to think about. You shouldn't be just aloof to it. But ultimately, like you said this morning, uh, our hope is not in if whether or not we get a good leader or a bad leader. Our hope is in God. He's the one that directs the kings of the earth. They literally sit in his hand. The only reason someone is given power is because God, for his own reasons, has allowed them to have power. Because again, this, this, the Bible and our current state, our, the, the year in which we're born, this, this season, this time, it's all in his control. You know, because sometimes I think we, we look at the Bible and we're like, yeah, God was really in control in the book of Acts. He was doing a lot of things, but today it seems like all the miracles are gone. All the promises, I, I don't know. I've been alive for 50 years or 60 years or however long you've been alive. And, and it's like, man, my life doesn't seem anything like what I read in the Bible. Maybe God's not there. Maybe I didn't believe enough. But that's not true. The reason the Bible seems so full of action, so full of miracles, so full of promises, is because, again, it's not primarily about the stories of man as though people are center stage. It's about God's actions, what he is doing what he is showing, what he is revealing. And to Israel, he's going to reveal that all these judges are going to fail you. In your future, you're going to get a king. You'll be like the other nations and have a king to lead you. But these kings are going to fail you. But the promise is, is that the throne of David will be forever. It'll be eternal. And one who is going to come is going to sit on that throne. And that is what Christ does today. He is seated at the right hand of his father, and everything else is made a footstool under his authority, his sovereignty, his power. So again, it may not seem in day-to-day -day life like God is in control, but he's not up there wringing his hands worried about the state of the world. He is seated, he is in control, and he is going to return. And that's what we have to look forward to. So let's go ahead and stand. We will uh, pray and uh, have a time of response. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your church, your people. Thank you for your gospel and how all of scripture points to Christ in one way or another. It's all revealing him as almost like a diamond, Lord, that's being held under the light. And uh, so, Father, I pray tonight that we all could see Christ, we could see your grace, and we could see how we're unworthy of it. Um, and Father, again, um, with your spirit, help move us. Help us to respond and that you may be glorified through it. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'll be down front uh, if anyone would like prayer. And uh, all right, Pastor Zeb.